What a race. What a race. Tyler Reddick wins an instant classic at Homestead. Kyle Larson calls the Gen 7 car stupid. Was this a good race? Welcome back to Break Hard. I'm Matt. I am fired up after the NASCAR Cup Series race at Homestead on Sunday, where we got an instant classic. That was the best playoff race we've ever seen in the NASCAR Cup Series. Remember when we used to play NCAA 14? You'd have a close game, you'd win. It'd pop up and say instant classic, you know, for ESPN Classic when that existed. Put this race on the NASCAR Classics website immediately because what a race, what a race we got on Sunday. Tyler Reddick, I told you all in the tier list that it was homestead or bust for Reddick that he needed to go out and win today and not have to go to homestead hoping to try to win in that race. And he did just that. Tyler Reddick, he's got the clutch gene. Unlike LeBron, Reddick does in fact have the clutch gene. He also does have a clutch in his car, but he's got that dog in him like people talk about. Reddick looked like he was out in this race and then he comes storming back on the last lap. We had three passes for the lead in the final two laps. I had to retype out my winner's tweet three times in the course of two laps. Absolutely ridiculous. So off the top, was this a good race? I'm gonna give this race a 92. This was a phenomenal race. If you didn't like what you saw on Sunday at Homestead, stop watching. I'll be honest with you. It's not gonna get that much better than what we saw. Okay, maybe a side-by-side -side finish. That'd about to be the only thing that you could really get that was that much better. This race was great from top to bottom. You have multiple lanes. You have tire management. You have throttle management. You have comers. You have goers. You have guys all taking various lanes, all fighting over the same position. You have the leader sending it, or technically second place, sending it to try to get the lead in Kyle Larson spinning out. You had natural cautions. You had your stage breaks. Of course, you had strategy play out there at the end. And then you had three different leaders in the final two laps of this race. Yes, this was a 92 every single day of the week, twice on Sunday, if we're being completely honest. Let's get into what happened in this race. So let's do a little bit of analysis. Let's do a little bit of recap. Let's get right into it. Starting off the race on lap number one, caution immediately comes out as the field goes through turns three and four because, well, Halloween's coming up and Justin Haley dressed up as Corey LaJoy today on Sunday. He sailed it off into turn three like Ricky Spinhouse just did not exist right there, turns himself off the nose of the 47 like he was Ichabod Crane and cleared himself. Clearly, he was not clear. So that brings out the first caution. And then from there, Things settle down a little bit until lap 47 when Kyle Larson cuts a tire down because that's just apparently what happens to Kyle Larson in the playoffs. Now, it's feast or famine for him. He's like the Detroit Lions. He's going to score 52 or it's going to be a really close nail biter and probably not win. It's just no in between at this point. And for Larson, he blows a tire down, cuts a tire going into the corner. Luckily for him, he was pretty close to the wall, ends up bringing out a caution because the carcass of the tire came off, which is logical, kind of saved his day right there because if that doesn't come out. He goes multiple laps down, probably at least one lap down. He's going to have to fight back for the rest of the race. He then is goes back out on track and at the stage break, Cliff's like, all right, what do you need out of the car? or under the caution rather. And Kyle's like, I need about 400 pounds more of downforce here. And Cliff's like, yeah, I know. And then Kyle <laughs> says to Cliff, can I vent for a second? And then complains about the Gen 7 car. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but it looked like Kyle Larson was down and out. On the restart after the Kyle Larson flat tire incident, we had something interesting happen. We had some cars that stayed out. They only had nine lap old tires. That being like Joey Logano, Kyle Busch, and a few others. Bubba Wallace lines up P5 to restart that race. In turn one, he goes P5 to first place, shoots the middle in an absolutely like movie style scene. Like it was cinematic, honestly, how he just shot through the middle right there like it was Days of Thunder. He comes over the radio and just says, God almighty, as he sailed right through there. And I think everybody was thinking the same thing. Ultimately, Tyler Reddick would go on to win stage number one, and he needed to maximize all the points that he could on Sunday. And that's exactly what he did, uh, getting that stage win, getting those 10 playoff points, because if he wasn't going to win, he needed to maximize the amount of points that he could get. And he started to do that very early on in this race. Nothing notable happened on track in stage number two, except for really, really good on track racing. You had multiple guys all fighting for the same position, four or five cars fighting for the same spot, all taking different lanes, all having to manage their tires, all having to manage their throttle. It was exactly what you would want out of Homestead. Anything that you could want. NASCAR fans always say that they want all these things, that they want good racing. You got everything you could have wanted on Sunday at Homestead, especially in stage number two. It was just a natural stage. It worked out perfect. You had plenty of guys out there contending for position. Yeah, sure, dirty air still exists. You don't wanna go into the corner behind a guy, but there's multiple lanes at Homestead for a reason. 
go ahead and use them. And guys are searching around trying to find that clean air and putting on a really, really good show. Turns out that not everybody was having a great time during stage number two, though, uh, because to quote Nicki Minaj, you got bees in the trap up on top of the spotter stand. I guess the spotter stand probably isn't the trap, but you know what I mean? They had a swarm of bees around the spotters. Uh, Chase Elliott's spotter, Trey Poole, was like, I think I might have to move from up here. Guys are swatting literally swatting flies up there, except they weren't inside the race car uh, trying to catch the wheel. They were literally trying to fight these bees off. And it got me thinking, uh, when it comes to like a beekeeper suit, do you think they make them in like Freddy Kraft size? Uh, not a, not, that's not a shot at Freddy, but I'm just asking because I think Freddy Kraft in a bee suit with having to wear the hood up on top of the spotter stand would actually be downright hilarious. I'm not saying he would look like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, but I am saying that like seeing all these spotters up there in beekeeper suits would be laugh out loud funny. Although it does seem a bit like a uh, workplace hazard. But stage number two played out. Denny Hamlin goes on to win that second stage. And again, he's a guy that needs to maximize his points. And he started to do that on Sunday as well. But ultimately, you kind of felt like he was probably going to need to win to get in. Well, that takes us to stage number three. With about 47, 46 laps left in this race, the leader started to pit. Ryan Blaney pits, Chase Elliott pits, um, Denny Hamlin uh, stays out a little bit longer. And then Tyler Reddick is continuing on. He just decides not to pit when everybody else pits. His uh, crew chief, Billy Scott, was like, we need a caution to come out here. We're not going to beat them on the strategy that we are currently on. We need to try to hope to get a caution. So as all that's happening, you have Ryan Blaney, Chase Elliott, Kyle Larson, and then Denny Hamlin pits uh, about nine to eight laps later than the rest of them. He comes back out and he is flying up through the field. But it's like, is he actually going to get there? Is it going to stall out a little bit? Well, as all of that's happening, the five gets around Chase Elliott. And Chase Elliott was told earlier in the race, five no longer your teammate. You can't race him as nice as you probably would, um, you know, in days past. The not, five gets around the nine, and he's catching the 12 of Ryan Blaney. Ryan Blaney inherits the lead when the 45 of Tyler Reddick pits. Now Reddick pits, and it's like, ah, uh, the strategy did not work out for them. They are going to need an absolute miracle. Three laps after Tyler Reddick pits, going into turn three on lap 255, there's only 267 in this race. Kyle Larson attempts to go three wide middle for the lead. Ryan Blaney um, is the bottom car, but not really on the bottom of the racetrack. Austin Dillon, who's still on the lead lap, is fighting to stay on the lead lap, is up against the wall, literally can't go any higher. And Larson to tries to shoot the middle in between them. And we've seen this happen before with Kyle Larson, right? Where he gets a little bit impatient. He takes risk when he probably doesn't need to. But I think in that moment, the risk was probably worth it just from the standpoint like if he clears the three car getting in right there he gets up to the wall that's his race that race is his to win if barring a caution coming out which wouldn't have because larson brought out the caution uh there instead of clearing the three car he ends up spinning out that brings out the caution well Kyle Larson never really lost his momentum. He slid down the racetrack and then just grabbed a gear and kept going. That allowed just Denny Hamlin to get in front of him, and Kyle Larson blended back in in P3. And I know a lot of people were upset about that, but that's a NASCAR rule. Like, that's just what it is. He blends back into where he was at because he never really lost that much pace. NASCAR throws the caution. He just comes back up on the racetrack uh, where he was at. You don't go to, like, the tail end of the line or anything uh, of that nature. Well, everybody comes down to pit. Um except for the 45 of Tyler Reddick. So coming off of pit road, Ryan Blaney comes out first, Denny Hamlin second, Chase Elliott others, and then Kyle Larson pits from third, comes out in P9 because the team had to go and get the diffuser flap down on the car because he spun out. And without that, they would have no rear downforce on the car. So they had to do that, end up losing six spots. Not ideal. Well, on the ensuing restart, you're like, Tyler Reddick's out here on like three lap old tires. They may eat him up. They may not. Uh, kind of was hit or miss. Well, the 11 car of Denny Hamlin gets out to the lead and the 12 of Ryan Blaney is catching him. And like, he's just not able to get all the way up along side of him. Well, coming down with two laps to go in this race, Ryan Blaney gets past the 11 of Denny Hamlin. I had already typed out with two laps to go. I typed out Denny Hamlin wins at home, said he will race for a championship in Phoenix. Well, Ryan Blaney gets around him. So I'm like, oh crap, I got to go in here and clear out Ryan or Denny Hamlin. I write Ryan Blaney wins at Homestead. He will get to defend his championship at Phoenix. And that all looked fine and good until Tyler Reddick just started ripping the top. And he goes from third to second 
to first into turn three on the last lap in second place. He puts it up right alongside the wall, sends it into the corner deeper than what Ryan Blaney did, clears him on corner or in the corner on corner exit, goes on to win this race to lock himself into the championship race at Phoenix in what a little bit over a week and a half's time. Absolutely phenomenal drive by Tyler Reddick. Great call by Billy Scott. Obviously, if that caution for Kyle Larson doesn't come out, the 45 day is absolutely ruined. Michael Jordan is running up pit road. He's fist pumping. He looks like he just won an NBA championship. He's talking to TV and he's like, just says little kid drove his ass off today, which Tyler Reddick is a full grown man with a wife and a child. But it's very funny to hear Michael Jordan referred to him as a little kid. Jordan then gets out on the front stretch and just absolutely picks up Tyler Reddick and celebrates with him because I mean, Jordan's what, like six, 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 seven. And Tyler Reddick is five, 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 six, probably on a good day, um, just picks him up and he's just swinging him around for Reddick. That was a statement win. Absolutely a statement win. Like I said, homestead or bust for the 45 car. And he now finds himself uh, headed to Phoenix with a shot at racing for a championship and does not have to worry about next weekend's race at Martinsville. For Denny Hamlin, though, it is just another type of way that he does not get to lock himself into the championship race at Phoenix. Whether it is Ross Chastain pulling a video game move, whether it's his steering breaking at Homestead last year, whether it's somebody else winning over him, he just can't get up there to win the race. It's always something for Denny Hamlin, the Buffalo Bills of the NASCAR Cup Series. He's good enough to get there, not good enough to stand on top of the stage with that trophy. Is this the demoralizing blow for Denny Hamlin? He was within three miles of locking himself into to race for a championship at Phoenix and instead has to watch the car that he owns in Tyler Reddick now go and have a shot to win that championship in Phoenix. For Hamlin, it feels like this may be that debilitating blow for him. He has not won at Martinsville since 2015. He hasn't won a fall race at Martinsville since 2010. And now he heads into next weekend at Martinsville going up against Three Hendrick cars that are all going to be very capable of winning there. Look what they did back in the springtime. He goes up against Ryan Blaney, who is very good at Martinsville. And it just, Chris Rebell, also incredibly good at Martinsville. And it feels like the cards might just be stacked against him going into it. For the points, though, obviously, Tyler Reddick's locked in. Joey Logano, locked in. Chris Rebell currently sits P3 plus 29. If he just has a cool, calm, and collected Martinsville next Sunday, he should be racing for a championship in Phoenix. Then you have William Byron in P4 at plus seven. Kyle Larson, P5 in points at minus seven. Danny Hamlin, minus 18. Ryan Blaney, minus 38. Chase Elliott, minus 43. Those two are in must-win positions. Danny Hamlin can still point his way in. And I'll be honest, I don't have that much faith in William Byron going to Martinsville in this race at only plus seven over the cutoff because last year, when the pressure got turned up on that 24 team, they wilted very, very fast um, in that race. And it was a struggle for them to get to the end. Uh, I know Byron didn't feel great. He overheated in the car. His heart rate, he said, was like 189. Super dangerous. If you know anything about hearts, you don't want your heart rate to get uh, up that high for a extended period of time. So we'll have to wait and see what Martinsville brings. But what seemed like it may be pretty straightforward going to Martinsville is no longer like that at all. And then our top 10 for this race, you have Tyler Reddick, of course, winning the race. Ryan Blaney coming home second. Denny Hamlin in third. Christopher Bell fourth. Chase Elliott, P5. And then you have William Byron, P6. Alex Bowman, P7. AJ Allmendinger, P8. Carson Hosevar, P9. Ryan Priest gets a top 10 finish for that Stuart Haas racing team as they approach uh, the last two races of their existence in the NASCAR Cup Series at Martinsville and Phoenix. Great for him. Also, fun fact, thanks to, I believe, Trey Ryan on Twitter, who has the best average finish in the Gen 7 era at Homestead? That would be AJ Allmendinger, 5.3 absolutely insane. Never would have expected that from him, but the call cars uh, at Homestead certainly have speed. After Kyle Larson cut a tire down and got into the wall and brought the caution out, uh, when he got back to pit road, Cliff Daniels assured him that the diffuser is fine. You maybe scrape the underbody a little bit, but we think that you're going to be good. Well, he goes back out on track and Cliff asks him underneath the next caution, hey, what do you need out of the car? And Kyle's like 400 pounds of downforce. Like this thing's just not handling at all. Now there's adjustments that they can make in the car or to the car rather uh, during the pit stops. A lot of dropping the rear of the race car basically as, as low as they can go, trying to get any sort of downforce. Um, onto the rear of that race car. So Kyle 
tells him that. So it's like, okay, we're gonna we're we're gonna figure this out under the pit stop here. And then Kyle keys up the mic and he said, I need to vent for a second. And then he just goes in and says, uh, quote, these f-ing cars are stupid. You get a flat tire, wear a little of your diffuser, and your race is ruined. And to an extent, he's not wrong there. Uh, there is so much emphasis put on the rear diffusers of these race cars to make them handle, uh, to get speed out of them for downforce. I mean, that's what they're there for. And he's right. If you do cut a tire down because there's a low profile on these tires, there's no sidewall, there's nothing to really ride on on these tires, it immediately just drops the car onto the ground. So you're dragging this diffuser back to pit road, knocking off strakes, grinding it down as he did in this situation. And it can ruin your race all because you had a tire go down, which wasn't anything that you caused. Like you hit something on the racetrack, had a slow leak, and then eventually finally just gives out. So I understand Larson's frustration uh, in this situation. And it's certainly something I think NASCAR will look at down the road. Everybody continues, continually says, get rid of the diffuser on this race car. I mean, you can, but I think you're opening up, uh, a box that I don't think a lot of people want to, like, if that was a solution, they would have done it already. And they've tested it out on short tracks and it didn't make that big of a change as what some people want. Uh, so I don't necessarily think taking it off is a good idea for the way that the car is designed. I'm not saying that diffuser is a great idea. I'm just saying that for this race car and the way it was designed, getting rid of it, I think is going to be more counterproductive than trying to fix it in its current form. But Larson brings up some good points there. I completely understand his frustration. And like I said, I think NASCAR understands the frustration behind it as well. And Ultimately, I don't think that the brass over at NASCAR, as much as some people don't like them, they don't want to see cars day. They don't want to see drivers days ruined because they got a flat tire. And when they drove back to pit road, it ruined the entire aerodynamics of the car. They don't want to see that. The problem is trying to find a solution for it that doesn't cost teams a ton of money. Yeah, there's probably wholesale changes that can be made to this car, but NASCAR doesn't want to pick up the bill for it. And the teams also don't want to pick up the bill for it. So it's why we kind of take these small gradual steps instead of just taking this huge home run swing at it and hoping that it gets out of the park and, you know, delivers us with that celebration that we want, which is good racing. Ultimately, the car races really good on mile and a half, but Larson definitely has a lot of frustration that I think is shared by a fair number of drivers in the series because a flat tire should not take you out of contention for this race. I saw some people be like, well, you got a flat tire in the Gen 6 era. It wasn't very good either. I mean, to a different extent, right? Like if you got a flat tire, there was enough of a sidewall for you to limp it back to pit road and not drag the entire underbody of the car. You also didn't have to worry about the underbody of the car because it wasn't as aerodynamically uh, dependent as it is with this car. The other problem with, you know, the Gen 6 car is if you cut a tire down, those tires would potentially come apart. And we saw a lot more cars getting fenders and quarters ripped off than we currently do now. So it's kind of a catch 22 that they're in. Uh, but ultimately, Kyle Larson was frustrated. Then, like I said, though, came back from the dead and then almost goes on to win that race. So let me know in the comments what you thought about the race today, what your score would be for it. Tyler Reddick, give me your thoughts on that. The final laps, Kyle Larson's comments, anything and everything, because I absolutely loved Sunday's NASCAR Cup Series race at Homestead. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.